Bro Handy, and I'm the director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archive here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And we're very happy to have all of you here this evening. And I would like to welcome our two guests this evening, Alan Williams and Lisa Rolfe. Alan and Lisa, say hello. Hello. Nice to see you both. Where are we finding you this evening? Uh, we are outside of Louisville, Kentucky. Um, we are coming to you live from um, the uh, collection of John Burton Harder's work owned by um, the foundation um, uh, founded uh, in his name. Um, we are sitting among um, abundant uh, drawings, paintings, um, and various ephemera, um, all meticulously um, and originally cataloged by him yep. um, that uh, we have been doing quite a bit of work on um, uh, over the last year. That's great. It's nice to connect with you in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, what's the weather like there right now? It's beautiful. We're finally seeing autumn ah. and um, 70 degrees today. And tomorrow's going to be in the lower 60s. So we're really going to have some nice, cool weather and we've been waiting for it. It's well, amazing. yes, it's, it's actually gotten a little cooler down here in South Florida. It's actually, it's now in like the low 80s. And it, the <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> and it's, it's burr. Very, yeah, it's been a very, I couldn't even get in the pool this weekend. It was too cold. <laughs> oh, <I'm> sorry. <laughs> no, I know, our hearts are breaking. Um, but, you know, just to, uh, to orient everybody, the painting behind, uh, in the middle of the two of you, of course, is a self-portrait by John Burton uh, Harder. And there he is. And I, I always have loved that particular painting because he's showing himself as an artist, but he's also showing himself as a gay man in, in that picture. There's no good question about that. And so, of course, we all love to see artists in their studios. And so it's I thank you for, very much for put, putting that particular piece up because I re really do think that's great. For those of you who don't know about Stonewall, um, we're located here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, we're one of the largest LGBTQ libraries and archives in the United States. Our library has 28,000 volumes in it, um, which is, they say, is the largest LGBTQ library in the world, um, or even the solar system. Um, I'm not quite sure. Maybe now that William Shatner has gone up into space, he's fr from there, <laughs> he's been able to see other things. Um, um, but um, our, so we are there, there are about 10,000 people a year who come and take books out or do research in the library. Um, and then our archive is 2,700 linear feet. And I used to not know what that meant, but if you were to uh, do 2,700 linear feet, that's all the way up one side of the Empire State Building and all the way down the other. It translates to 6 million pages of LGBTQ history. For us, it mostly goes back to 1950 to the present day. Um, and you can really see a lot of what we have in our archive by going to stonewall-museum.org. There are finding aids there and other research tools that are there. And thanks to a grant from the Mellon Foundation, uh, we're very happy that uh, we'll begin digitizing that work uh, th this year. Uh, and so that's great. I also want to do a shout out to our friends at the R Fund Foundation. Uh, they're located here in South Florida. They are an LGBTQ community foundation. And they're the ones who have made this whole series possible for us. We started this in the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as of right now, I was looking at statistics earlier today. In 2021, there have been over 40,000 people have viewed these talks that we have done. So these talks, um, it really has been sort of amazing to build a national audience and to build a base. The talks are all archived on our website at stonewall-museum.org. And so you'll be able to see this if you have friends who are interested in Harder's work or about hearing about artists' legacies, uh, they can come back and see it. I wanna say hello to our friends on Facebook. Hello, everybody. Um, I do have a few issues about Facebook, but I don't go there. I'm just happy to see all of you folks there. There. And uh, please feel free uh, to f follow uh, us there as well, too. I want to say hello to my colleague, Paula Sierra, who's here behind the scenes. Hello, Paula. 
There you are. Nice to see you, Paula. Lovely to see you. Thank you. Paula just got her MFA in Curatorial Studies from um, uh, FIU in Miami, and she's now going to become our, our archival digital manager. And so she'll be the one who'll be leading the melon charge, uh, which is re really great for us. And so, Paula, thank you for all the great work that you do at Stonewall. It's, it's great thank to you. have you, you there. Um, we have two um, exhibitions um, at Stonewall, one right now, uh, we're w winding down, but there's no reason not to see it, which is called Don't Ask, Do Tell, and it's, it speaks to the tortured 225-year uh, re relationship between the LGBTQ community and uh, the U.S. military. And we actually start out with a lieutenant of George Washington, who was uh, in prison for sodomy. We go through the Newport of uh, Rhode Island scandals, um, and then even right down to the official um, the documents that we have for, from our archives, from uh, the military, that laid out how you could um, 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 imprison and uh, discharge uh, gays and lesbians in the military in the 1940s. We go to um, the uh, don't ask, don't tell but policy of the Clinton administration, including an amazing full page ad in April 1993 in USA Today with no one other than the very late Colin Powell saying that if gays joined the military, it would destroy the United States military, which is just sort of astonishing to think that that those kind of things have happened in our lifetime. Um, but so it's it's an interesting exhibition to to sort of look at that relationship and the complexities of that relationship, and actually how, of course, the president of the United States, um, without Congress's approval, has a tremendous amount of control over these kind of things. We're thankful to today, of course, under Joe Biden's administration, that uh, there are no barriers uh, for LGBTQ people serving in the military. And as of right now, there are over 65,000 of the over 500,000 active military members of the US military in the United States who are openly gay. And it's not quite 10%, but it's really, it's well, actually it's about 12%, which is really sort of an amazing thing. And so, you know, times have definitely changed. And, and also just one last piece on that. It was nice to see in honor of the 10th anniversary of the end of Don't Ask, Don't, Don't Tell, uh, the Veterans Administration just in the end of September said that it would restore all VA uh, benefits as well as pension benefits to anybody who had been discharged from the US military as a result of, of their alleged homosexuality. So, I mean, it's interesting that we're living long enough to see amazing changes like this happen in our lifetime. So that show will be up probably for about another month. Uh, tomorrow, we're opening a new exhibition called Misinformation, uh, the true and not so true facts about uh, the early days of the AIDS epidemic. And so some people might remember that AIDS kind of came to the forefront in July of uh, 1981 with a story in the New York Times. And then, of course, it hit into the gay press. And so what we've looked at is are all the rumors uh, that were circulating. There were things about don't trust vaccines, about vitamin C would, would help you get cured of AIDS, uh, that there were also very judgmental things about this was re related to promiscuity as opposed to a virus. There were those who didn't believe it was virally connected. And the similarities between what's happening today in 2021 with the COVID with the COVID virus and what happened 40 years ago is just totally remarkable. So that show um, is coming out of a series of books that we have that we've actually had to take off of our public facing shelves because they are no longer accurate um, about HIV and AIDS, but we brought them back out and put into the exhibition as well as serials 
from the gay press from San Francisco to New York to Boston to Chicago to actually show what was actually being spread at that particular time and the rumors and innuendos. There's one book that says it's America's first politically protected disease. There's another article that talks about AIDS uh, being a time bomb that is living inside of everyone due to polio vaccines. And so again, these are just tropes and ideas that have been repeated over and over again. And it's very, it's really very helpful and illustrious to, uh, to, to what we're seeing today. So that show actually opens tomorrow and that will be up until the beginning of December. So again, it's stonewall-museum.org. If you're here in South Florida, uh, please come by and see these things. Um, and um, if not, you can always contact us through the website. We have lots of researchers coming in and out every day at the museum. And so it's great to be able to see everybody. So I think that's everybody on my list. So now, Alan and Lisa, it's nice to see you uh, again. And um, so Lisa, tell us a little bit about your, your background. Well, um, I started working um, in a museum about 35 years ago. I started um, as a volunteer and very soon, I was um, getting an undergraduate degree at U of L at the time, and just on campus was um, the Spi Art Museum, which is the largest fine art um, institution in Kentucky. So, um, volunteered there and eventually got a position as a registrar. Mm. And I was there for 35 years. Wow. And um, it was a wonderful, wonderful time. I enjoyed working with the collection. And I left um, the museum in February of uh, 2020, literally uh, the last day of February, and literally two days, uh, excuse me, two weeks after we were in um, pandemic mode. And so um, I was just home for a bit. And um, long story short, uh, I got a call from Alan trying to find a registrar type. And, um, I was completely available and very anxious to start um, working with collections again. So, um, and, and I, just, just tell the audience a bit uh, what does a registrar in the museum world do? Okay. We are um, collections managers. We literally are, if you can imagine, traffic controllers for the art. So, when the artwork comes in, it has to be registered. It has to be reviewed. It has to be placed in storage. It has to be cared for. And um, we were the ones who would make uh, all loans available. If someone wanted to gift to the museum, everything went to the registrar's office. Mm -hmm. So literally controlling the comings and the goings, if you will, and the storage of all the artwork. So it's like being the caretaper for the art, the literal yeah. artwork. And the traffic cop, too, in the sense you're the one to be sure every I was dotted, every T was crossed, everything was insured, things were being shipped as they were supposed to be and returned when they were supposed to be. Absolutely. We talked about that earlier today. Mm -hmm. We were talking about the importance of contractual language when you're borrowing things. Another thing that um, was really a wonderful part of being a registrar was acting as courier. And mm -hmm. so I would transport art, I've transported art all over the world. I've right. been in many a big, big rig for mm -hmm. um, way too long, but it's, it's, been, <laughs> it's very interesting. I've got, I could probably write a book about my travels just being in the trucks alone with the artwork. I, I think that would be very interesting, quite very frankly. Cool. I don't know that I've actually read that book, and so I think it would be interesting. So before, so in your past, did you work with a, uh, um, with a gay artist work before is this or have you or is this the first time you have you've moved you've been in this genre no um the the museum um was encyclopedic we had everything from literally um egyptian artifacts to contemporary art so i worked with all manner of yep. artwork yep. And, and um just all manner of artwork great and so, Alan, tell us a little bit about your background. I also started out working in a museum um, over 20 years ago. 
Um, I was uh, hired out of undergrad as a publications assistant at a museum and research archive in New Orleans. Um, I grew up loving New Orleans. I could not wait to get there and um, uh, really flourished and was already influenced even before moving and through college and uh, beyond working in this museum was even more so. Um, and uh, this museum was really dedicated to um, uh, New Orleans Gulf South uh, history and culture. Um, I worked in bringing um, uh, to press a variety of publications from newsletters to coffee table books, as well as exhibition materials, from everything from wall cards to promotional materials. Mm -hmm. And um, the people of that era of my life, um, like New Orleans, um, were so essential um, to me then um, and now um, as um, uh, someone who already had a um, archival spirit um, as a, a book loving geek um, and also um, as um, uh, someone who was coming um, ever more fully into um, uh, himself um, and, and higher self uh, through full acceptance. And um, I've continued past uh, that time um, and place, even though I still live in New Orleans in my heart, um, with um, uh, those insights and those investments. Um, and uh, now uh, through uh, uh, different wandering career uh, twists and turns that we all have, um, I'm now the director of the communications agency. Um, that focuses on public health and um, social and behavior change. Um, I specialize in bringing a public health approach to violence prevention, specifically mm -hmm. for um, uh, populations um, put at greater risk, um, uh, especially LGBTQ uh, groups um, due to um, social inequality and looking at how um, uh, health and well-being can be um, better advanced at the community level. Mm -hmm. And my passion um, continues to be um, uh, archival work and uh, art, and um, especially with um, uh, a queer focus. Mm -hmm. And um, a, a, a gentleman named George Jordan, who I worked with, um, at uh, the museum early on in my life, um, as well as others from, from that time who um, became more than colleagues, but deep friends, um, ultimately um, uh, engaged me and what I had, had really done in the communication space um, uh, to um, apply that uh, to um, the legacy of John Burton Harder through um, the foundation. And um, it's been an honor and a joy, um, uh, not only to, to connect with Harder in, in really intimate ways through an incredible body of work, um, but also um, great minds and, and hearts um, like Lisa, um, who um, uh, live and work um, with, um, incredible intention um, as, a, as a steward in this space. It's so, it's so great that you use the word steward, of course, because it's something I think all the time that, of course, those of us who are, who are here t today um, can only hope that stewards of our work will be out there the same way we take care of other people's work like this. And so it's, it's a great privilege to take care of people's work. And so, Alan, you're based out of Atlanta these days, right? Yes. Yes, yes, which I think is important. And also I think what's important for us at Stonewall in the sense that a lot of our focus has been on the American Southeast. Um, 
And so we have a lot of holdings from Georgia, from Alabama, from the Mississippi, and particularly unusual holdings. And so, Alan, when you and I connected last year, it was sort of something that I thought was really important about Harder's work in, in the sense that there is this connection and this importance. And I'll say this with the bias against myself is, so I grew up in, in Boston and spent a lot of time in New York. And so I'm sort of one of those gay men that are very urban, large city centric. And so I think about the gay world being focused around New York and Chicago and San Francisco and Los Angeles, but hello, uh, there were a lot of other queer people in the rest of the world. And, and so I found this to be so incredibly fascinating and, and, and just a, you know, as I say, a, a, something that I didn't realize before that, you know, in many ways, these were individuals that needed to or wanted to assert themselves, but not necessarily in sort of the mainstream gay way of doing it. And, and that they had a desire to express themselves in different ways that were more appropriate and or appropriate to, to them. And, and I have to do a shout out because you mentioned him and we talked about it before, George Jordan, who's somebody who I, I knew very well when I was at the Leslie Loman. He was a wonderful curator and, and um, involved in several museums in New Orleans. And, and so, uh, uh, you know, George, our, um, if I had a little bit of brown liquid in a glass to, to ah, yes. you right now, uh, please know that we are thinking of you it, 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 and Michelle and, uh, and uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very sweet to think, but you know, it's important. I, I don't mean to sort of go for the heartstrings here, but it's important as we move things through and think about laying down a record that we are sure that we, we speak about those individuals who, who were there before us and, and doing that, because I think it's, uh, as you say, he influenced you and, and uh, I got to know him as a co colleague and, and he was really just a lot of fun. So, so let's talk about Mr. Harder. Uh, so, uh, uh, John Burton Harder um, lived for 62 years. He was born in 1940. He died in 2002. Um, either one of you can go for this to just set us up to like what he was, uh, where he was growing up that got him to art school, that got him to the point where he was going to be a creative. Give us just a uh, a few a few minutes about his his background in that way. Um, John Burton Harder um, was born in uh, Jackson, Mississippi. However, his formative years were spent very close to here, um, uh, and actually very near where Lisa lives uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, he uh, got his bachelor's um, at the uh, University of Louisville. Um, and ultimately um, uh, went on to get his master's at um, uh, Louisiana State University. Um, he also was um, uh, deeply shaped by uh, New Orleans and the Gulf South. Um, most of his um, adult life um, was spent there. Mm. Um, he um, also started out um, in uh, the museum field. Um, he um, uh, worked at various institutions, um, including the Historic New Orleans Collection. Um, ultimately, he went to uh, Louisiana State Museum um, and uh, progressed up through the ranks of position to um, be um, uh, the chief curator of collections uh, at that institution um, for um, the prime of, uh, of uh, his professional life and career. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, those are the, the, the kind of factoids. Um, yeah. uh, it, provides, his, it provides good context because he was in Louisville and then he moved to the bigger city from Louisville down to New Orleans and he was attracted down there. Uh, w whether or not he thought of it in that way, we, we, uh, I don't know. But he spent uh, from 74 to 91 working in curatorial positions in New Orleans. And, and so that was his day job. And then clearly he viewed himself 
and was an accomplished artist and was making a whole trove of work. And Lisa, have you been able to figure out as registrar how many pieces of work exist numerically? I can tell you that I have 4,166 pieces here. Wow. So, so it's over 4,000. Yeah. It's over 4,000, over 4,100. Um, what's interesting is he, he kept everything that he drew. He kept mm. all of his artwork. I literally have found work from 1948 when he was eight years old. And it says this was his first painting and also his second painting that he had done um, as a young child. And so there's artwork from that time and his time at U of L um, taking art classes. And so he's kept a little bit of everything. So there's much artwork. That's literal drawings and paintings, but there's also a great deal, and we can talk about this later, but a great deal of photography. Mm -hmm. He was an avid photographer and he uh, was an avid traveler. He took, there's a lot of travel um, photography, but also he used himself as model. Yeah. And he did a lot of self portraits and used his friends as models. So there's a lot of photography here as well. So there's a whole storage unit filled with um, artwork and photography. Mm -hmm. You raise a you raise a point which is a question for, for me in the sense that uh, going back to that very very early time, is there any evidence that you found about other creatives? Um, in his parents or other influences where he would believe it was so important for him to mark at an early age, my first painting, my second painting. I have to wonder if this is just genetics. You know, sometimes people just, he, he's a chronicler, mm. chronicles everything. And I think that's just in his makeup. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. You know, I just, I, I he, he, relished the work that he was making and he kept it mm -hmm. and he kept great records mm -hmm. of everything that he did he made his own catalog cards for things and um so it's it's something that i think he was very aware of just yeah. keeping, well, I, I think that that's, and tracking things yeah i think that's a really good point because some of it is is just about even at an early age that somebody thinks about things and look in a linear way and sort of a time-based way that they think about things like that. And I, I, I think that that's, that's an important piece to sort of try to understand the, the individual as we go through it. Well, I know that you guys have prepared um, a little PowerPoint to uh, show us some of the, the work. So maybe we can show that because I think I'd like to get into the point where we start seeing some of the, the work um, and um, and sort of have you describe for us what we're seeing here. Certainly, um, I will share my screen and we'll dive in. Can you see Hunter? I can't see it yet. Uh oh. You you have permission. I just checked. There we go. Now I see it. All right. Thank you. Um, um, so this is a, a salient quote um, of Harder that's uh, really representative of so much that um, uh, we're going to show. Um, he says, I'm an artist first and a gay artist incidentally, but a large part of my work reflects a gay orientation. It isn't an agenda especially, but it is representative of imagery I feel important both to me and to viewers of my work. This is a, a holistic capturing of who he is. Um, he uh, really saw himself, it's fair to say, um, as first and foremost uh, an, an artist. And he brought that artistry to what he created, yes, and also to um, his role as, um, as uh, a curator. Um, he brought it to uh, his friendships uh, and relationships. And it is um, a, a way of being um, cast through a gay lens that was essential both to who he is, 
uh, and also um, uh, the uh, uh, world that he was documenting, um, as well as um, the audience that he had in mind. Um, again, quick bio. Um, uh, his formative years were spent in Louisville. Um, he um, has both a, mas or a, a bachelor's and, and later a master's um, that uh, were art focused. Um, uh, after getting started in um, uh, registrar work, um, he uh, moved to the Louisiana State Museum where he was from 74 to 1991. Um, ultimately, uh, 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 being the curator of collections um, and overseeing all work there. Um, and he died um, in New Orleans uh, in 2002 um, in um, an untimely uh, uh, death. Um, he was um, discovered murdered in his home. Um, a, a couple of, of quick facts about um, the art you're about to see. Um, he was active primarily from uh, the 1960s to the 2000s, although, um, as Lisa <laughs> said, uh, there are more and more discoveries going um, as far back as eight. Um, uh, that now um, has totaled more than 4,100 works, um, uh, including uh, drawings as well as paintings spanning largely portraits and self-portraits. Um, Harder, um, who uh, was known um, affectionately um, as Bert to his friends, we might slip into calling him Bert, um, uh, out of affection. Um, he really credited uh, Paul Cadmus um, as um, a major inspiration. Um, and um, his uh, uh, body of work largely reflects um, and, and documents um, gay male uh, culture, environments, settings, um, and connections um, that were occurring from um, really the, the 70s um, uh, through the 90s. Um, he also focused um, and has um, a number of uh, Gulf South uh, and Louisiana landscapes. Um, and uh, over the bulk of his life, he traveled to um, more than 40 countries, really unique uh, uh, countries like, um, and, and areas like Bhutan and uh, Patagonia, uh, New Zealand, um, East Asia uh, uh, appears to be a, a favorite um, uh, place to, to return to. And you see um, uh, those cultures and, and and people and diversity um, showing up uh, in his work as well. Um, so uh, Harder really excels um, as um, uh, a, a it, in the uh, drawings, um, in, in particular, the really fine uh, figure studies and the compositions um, that uh, he uh, did throughout his career. Um, you know, the work is incredibly detailed, um, uh, in very, very fine um, uh, anatomy studies, um, you know, but also exploration, explorations in, in shading through a variety of techniques. Um, the piece on the, on the right, draped figure, has a background with the most tiny, minute uh, cross hatchings. Um, these are you know, really detailed, uh, time-intensive, um, uh, marvelous works to, um, to, uh, to really see. Um, Was he, did he write, uh, going back to those drawings for a minute, were you able to find any contemporaneous drawings about his point of view in these drawings, what he was going after? Was he a diar? As I see, of course, the diarist here. But what was he? Was he creating a di diary about these pieces? We find that these um, uh, drawings are really expansive um, and comprehensive across uh, topics. Um, the early drawings are really focused on 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 the male form. I mean, they're they're very anatomical in nature. And the 
as he progresses, you see um, you know, a variety of, of scenes from um, the everyday um, to um, works that continue to be focused on um, the figure um, that have various levels of um, eroticism uh, infused through them. So I, I would say, um, you know, because the work is in fact just so prolific and the, um, you know, the topics and, and scenes Hunter are, are just so wide ranging and also that um, scholarship is, is really uh, just starting mm -hmm. to truly take um, uh, a renewed interest that's um, a, a question that, that we're holding and, and, and learning more about um, with every other box that's opened <laughs> and uh, article that uh, is um, being researched. Occasionally, um, there are papers. He, he really journaled quite, quite a bit. And yes. occasionally, I will find his writings. And he'll, he'll refer to paintings and just talk about um, his process. So. There's more information to be found, but um, I suspect there are more. There's more information mm. that hopefully can be connected with the work itself. Yeah, I I only ask because of course you look at the uh, the marvelous detail in these two drawings that you've put here, and you think of course here's a, here is an intellectual engaged individual, sort of in the prime of his career. And he wants to be sure, um, not that he knew about his um, early d demise, but y you would want to think that he wanted to put this in some kind of context because he, as a curator, of course, he understood, you know, 2,000, 3,000 years of art history. He, he was trained as an artist. He understood the importance of interpretation. Um, and, and here he is creating something. And actually at the time, you know, he's creating something which was not generally accepted um, uh, within the canons of art history. Right. Let's and, move on to the next one. Yeah. Um, so many of um, his works across mediums, and especially um, uh, his paintings um, have a, um, a social realism um, that's you know, documenting you know, gay male life, um, especially um, in the in the seventies through the nineties um, and and two thousand, uh, where uh, or when the the Watchers um, was painted, and what you see. Um, emerge across a lot of these works in totality are you know, representation of um, a, a kind of radical uh, community. Um, one, communities that may be in, um, you, know, a, you know, a closed off, um, uh, certainly male-centric environment, such as a bathhouse, um, but also within that community, um, real camaraderie and um, uh, uh, a sense of joy. Um, you see support, um, you see um, intimate connection. And through these uh, uh, paintings and, and others, you just feel a real um, you know, warmth and um, uh, even kindness shown. Um, bet between men uh, in these spaces. And you know, that focus on um, uh, the way friendship, relationship, um, uh, whether um, short-term or long-term, the way it sparks, where it sparks, giving rise to um, you know, a, a radical community um, is um, one major recurring theme that uh, has been um, you know, really resonant uh, to see, especially with the positive nature of it, um, you know, both uh, 
you know, in his, his lifetime, uh, as well as, as well as now. Mm. Great. And, um, again, uh, you know, that joy, um, that celebration, uh, as it's named here, um, you know, the affection, um, and the, the centering of, of that uh, male love um, and support is um, you know, just a delight. Um, there's a, an, an intimate delight, but one that um, he continually uh, comes back to again and again um, in a way that, um, you know, is, uh, you know, by turns, um, joyful, somber, uh, and, and kind of everything in between. You know, it's interesting. I look at this, I look at celebration here at 94 and then look uh, back one slide at Bathhouse um, at, uh, I think that was, yes, in 1996, and then look at his chronology. And it looks like he stopped working in uh, major institutions in 91. And I wonder if while he was connected with major cultural institutions, he would have been able to make and show this particular work, which is um, so, um, it's not erotic in the way we think of uh, certainly other artists, but there is, and particularly for New Orleans, um, it's, you know, here he is putting his homosexuality on his sleeve. He, he's making it clear there is no question. Could he have, did he, and could he have made this work in the 80s when he was still deep into his jobs in uh, major mu museums? That's a really fascinating point. Thank you for bringing up um, the fact that these are occurring after 1991 professionally. The other timelines that really come to mind um, that, uh, again, some scholarship is, is still progressing, but it, I think it, uh, alongside, um, you know, him um, moving fully into this work um, uh, after the Louisiana State Museum um, are, are two things. One, um, he, uh, we learned last year in a um, oral history given by Charles Leslie, uh, one of the co-founders of Leslie Lillman, um, that uh, uh, Patrick Angus was um, uh, an influence that um, Carter shared with Charles um, as uh, someone who had, whose work in addition to Cadmus had meant a lot to him. And when you start to, um, line up some of the early uh, works um, that, you know, can, can be really commenting on um, social life. Um, it, it, it's, it lines up with a, a, a kind of exposure to, you know, uh, Angus's uh, uh, major works that are, you know, occurring in, and are, and are portraying, say, the bar scenes. Um, you, you then start to see Harder do more of that kind of work after. Before that, he's just far more um, focused on uh, the, the figure and, and, and the male form solo rather than, um, rather than groups and, and um, uh, relationships of all types. Also, another um, kind of timeline mention um, especially toward the end of his life, is that um, you know, Harder was um, not out publicly, mm -hmm. um, only to a select few for most of his adult life. Mm -hmm. um, it was really only at the end, it, or, or um, not end, but it was really after, uh, frankly, his mother passed that um, he um, uh, came out fully um, as a gay man. And there's a fascinating um, uh, attention uh, between um, his, uh, you know, focus on 
the male form, especially his own form. He was uh, his first model um, and continued to be. We, um, let's move into that actually. So um, Harder uh, 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 worked through a photographic process. Um, he would photograph himself um, often um, and in various poses and then work through a series of stages. Um, uh, drafting, doing really interesting um, uh, 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 sketches with them and fascinating uh, uh, grids with a draftsman-like approach. Um, on the journey, uh, iterating a vision for an image. Um, but, and, and while he did uh, uh, have a, a number of models whom he also photographed, um, over his life as an artist. Um, he used him, his own form first and, and, and foremost. Um, and uh, speaking again to that kind of uh, uh, beautiful tension between someone who you know, truly was, was closeted, he really put that, um, put himself forward, um, who he is, who he, uh, um, physically was um, onto uh, the paper and, and canvas as a gay man. And coming full circle to your point, um, it's, it's in the 90s when he's fully out that um, is also aligning with that timeline that that, that focus um, on, um, on, on groups and also his, his own form in groups um, starts to happen. Yeah, and I think in looking at these three images, in a sense, you're looking at something in um, 76, something in 77, and something in 79, um, just in a three-year period. And he would have been um, somewhere between um, 37 and 39 at this time. He would have been well into his professional career. Um, but to my eye, of course, looking at these, these, th this is somebody, particularly because he's using himself, his, his own body, um, he's not trying to hide um, any sense of who he was as a gay man. I mean, he's putting it out there. Now he's putting himself there alone, which is different than the ones we're looking at the 90s in which there's actually touching somebody else. But, he's, but I don't see him hiding anything here. I, I, I see him, and of course, I, I don't know, and maybe you guys know how well these paintings were displayed at the particular time. Was he showing his work at galleries and were, were people actually seeing that, this work? Uh, but, you know, JBH Back to the Wall in 1977 is like a beautiful painting in the sense it's so nicely uh, put together compositionally and, and also his technique. But then also, he, it, there's so much re revelation in that painting where he's not afraid to show who he is. He's not making himself out to be the Thomas Selleck or Tom of Finland kind of uh, uh, clone or sort of perfect individual. He looks slightly nerdy in this picture. And his, <laughs> yeah, yeah, his body is is not perfect, which was the which was the the cause celeb at the time. Of course, you know this is all pre AIDS we're t talking about here. This is at the height of the gay male clone period. And he was not afraid to show himself in it. He wanted to show some muscle, but he was not afraid of showing himself as just being an average Joe out there, which I find to be incredibly uh, brave and pr proud of him. Yeah. And Hunter, to your point, um, he uh, really emphasized these portrayals in a variety of ways over his entire life. And um, you know, what we see and, and I personally find so poignant is that you know, he really creates um, a record of, of himself and who he was um, incarnate um, over his entire life course through his art. Um, so you see here on the left, um, 
him in profile uh, in 74, um, you know, with a, you know, a, a particular hustler-esque cap. Um, and then in 1997, um, you know, his, his form uh, likely photographed from behind, um, you know, of a, of a more mature man. Um, and, uh, you know, being very cheeky in multiple ways uh, on guard um, with, uh, um, and it's, it's just been particularly, um, you know, I think beautiful to, to uh, look at his self portraits um, in a linear way, um, you know, against the backdrop of, of what's happening in his life, as well as the, the other works that he's exploring or things that he's exploring. <laughs> It, we'll keep, keep going, but just as uh, just as a point of re reference, uh, J. B. Harder's self in 1974, I think, is in the pieces you've shown so far, a really good testament to his talent as a draftsman. This is a beautiful drawing uh, that we're looking at here. This has incredible power to this particular. Now it, he's doing it of himself, of course, but it's a beautiful drawing that that we're looking at here. Um, so, uh, as AIDS, uh, continued to take, um, more and more lives of, of gay men, friends, colleagues, um, in the, uh, early nineties, um, Harder started what he called ultimately, uh, AIDS wall. Um, he would, uh, paint portraits of uh, friends and, and loved ones um, who were uh, living with uh, HIV AIDS um, and uh, who um, ultimately died um, from complications. Um, and these were uh, memorials to um, uh, who they were um, in, their, uh, in their prime uh, through um, uh, that that celebratory eye that uh, that he would bring, while also capturing um, you know their their unique personalities um, as well. Um, these uh, what you're looking at um, is um, the installation of uh, 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 many works from this series, not all but many, um, uh, in a conference room at Crescent Care. Um, Crescent Care is um, an organization that um, provides low-cost medical services um, in New Orleans. Um, it is um, uh, the organization that, that grew out of the NOAIDS task force. Um, in Harder's life, uh, he was the largest uh, individual donor um, to uh, the NOAIDS task force. And um, it when uh, Crescent Care opened uh, uh, their newest facility on Elysian Fields in, in New Orleans, um, they wanted um, a focus on uh, uh, art by uh, queer artists. And um, this uh, had a lot of synergy um, to uh, explore, you know, a permanent loan of, of uh, this work um, to um, you know, this institution that had meant uh, so much to him in terms of um, you know what they provided, um, not only in terms of, of uh, medical care and, and services, um, but also to um, the community um, that um, Crescent Care not only uh, took, takes care of, but also strengthens uh, through um, uh, outreach and uh, uh, various community-based initiatives. Um, and uh, again, Harder passed in um, 2002. Um, uh, as we mentioned, um, he uh, died in um, a murder that took place in his home. 
um, it is still uh, considered um, an open investigation as the New Orleans Police Department defines it um, and is, is still an unsolved mystery. What do we know about it today um, about that murder? You know, it's, uh, unfortunately, a hunter, not enough. Um, there uh, uh, was evidence that was gathered that, from what we understand, um, uh, uh, was compromised um, uh, in Katrina. Um, and, you know, there are, you know, various uh, uh, pieces of information that, um, you know, that still need dots connected. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and any information actually that, that anyone has um, would be incredibly valuable in, in learning more. Um, but he, he passed in, uh, away in, in his home in, in, this, in this murder. Uh, and um, uh, he was stabbed to death. Um, and um, it really rocked uh, uh, the entire community of New Orleans. Um, he was incredibly beloved, beloved, very well liked, very well known. Um, he was a, a, a generous friend to so many. And um, it was, uh, uh, very disturbing uh, mm -hmm. then and now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, having having an unknown uh, end like this, he was a young man in the sense he was only 62 at the time that it happened. Um, and um, uh, so it's, you know, he'd be, um, he'd be well into his 80s right now where he's still alive today uh, and hopefully still making work. We only have a few minutes left, um, and I have a couple more questions, but um, Alan, do you have any more slides you want to show here? Uh, um, we've talked a lot about the collection, um, just with where we're at. Um, uh, Lisa, would you like to say anything more about kind of our process? And Well, um, I'm so pleased that mm -hmm. um, the trustees are taking um, this so seriously in the legacy of, his, of, of Bert's, of Harder's art. Um, I was charged with um, doing an inventory. And with that, um, I've established a database for all of the collection. And with the database is just um, your basic information concerning the piece. So everything has been literally seen, you know, viewed, um, photographed. Um, and I have made um, condition reports for every work in the collection. So it's, it's, it's been um, wonderful getting that into a database so that everything um, is in one central space. Another thing that um, going forward I want to work on, um, just being a good steward for the collection and getting things in archival, using archival materials to, uh, to store the work and I think at some point in time we may need to um, think about some conservation for some of the works. So it's just been a very wonderful process of uh, checking um, what's here and um, glorifying it in some way uh, and recording everything. Do you see a catalog resume at some point in the future? <sighs> no? Oh, I oh. would love to see that, but I'm not sure who would do that, but that would be a wonderful um, project, yes. I've often said this would be a, um, the body of work here between the massive amounts of photography, the art itself, his writings, um, it could be an excellent dissertation for someone. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, you know, and to the extent that there are uh, candidates out there looking for projects to work ah. on. We haven't even touched on his writings or his foot photographs here we've really just you know we, we've probably only seen 15 of his images here mm -hmm. and uh people should go to remind us what the name of the foundation website is uh, uh 
John, it is. Uh, JB Harder Foundation, uh, no, jbharder.org. Um, I think for people, oh yes, thank you, Paula, for throwing that, that up there so that people can actually see uh, more of the work that's there. Um, Alan, just in the few minutes that we have left here, um, talk a little bit about the work of the foundation. I know you serve as a, as a member of the board and, and you know, we've talked about Harder's um, untimely death and, and obviously he had at least sufficient resources to put together a, a charitable foundation at, at the time. Um, and you guys are working to collect his work and understand what it's about, and understand his legacy. But tell us a little bit about what the foundation does and, and how it supports gay artists out there today. The mission of uh, the John Burton Harder Foundation is to um, uh, promote and, and protect um, Harder's art, as well as the interests that he cared about. And what that looks like um, is really um, supporting uh, the community of um, uh, LGBTQ artists working today. Um, and that takes a variety of forms. Um, the foundation um, uh, supports uh, various exhibitions with um, uh, a queer focus, um, also publications and community-based uh, initiatives. Um, for example, um, the foundation has um, supported um, uh, survey shows um, from uh, uh, exhibitions at um, Museum of the City of New York, um, the Leslie Lohman, um, uh, Wadsworth Athenium, uh, as well as others um, that are um, you know, really um, uh, uh, have a very particular focus and, and theme and narrative um, that um, Harder, um, uh, within his own story, um, can help tell um, some of the, the, the strongest um, uh, showcases that, that have been staged are um, ones in which um, you know, his voice is, is added to um, a chorus um, and his work is so diverse and, and multifaceted um, that uh, there are a number of, of themes that um, really connect to um, really that radical community of, of support. Um, and the, the beauty of the foundation is that it has made possible those initiatives, um, not just uh, on museum walls, but also um, through um, the uh, LA um, LGBT Center. Um, for example, um, they had um, uh, for a couple of years, a live drawing class in which um, uh, participants would, um, you know, take an art course. Um, they, uh, uh, in several classes, um, would um, uh, do drawings uh, of a male figure of a nude. Um, they were, the nudes were actually based on um, uh, works of Harder. Um, they were shown the work of Harder after uh, they completed their work, um, and it really fostered a dialogue um, intergenerationally um, uh, between um, uh, uh, members of the community, but also um, the artistic community. Um, and there was a showcase of, of their work um, alongside his. And that's just really one um, you know, really fascinating way um, that has been really meaningful for, for art and, and community to come together to strengthen uh, one another. Um, the foundation has also... That's great. And it really sounds like it's so consistent with what his wishes were of being able to get this work out there and to be able to nurture um, nurture other artists. So Lisa Rolfe and Alan Williams, thank you so much for being here. Lisa, good luck uh, in continuing your work and re registering these uh, and cataloging these pieces. Uh, I vote for the uh, catalog resume, however that happens. I think that would be an amazing thing. Alan, congratulations on all the work that you're doing professionally, 
in Atlanta, but also the work that you're doing with the foundation as well, too. I think this is just great. Uh, may you make lots of money in the foundation to allow you to give out more money to other organizations out there. And actually, you know, to, to get um, Harder's work out there um, in the sense that people can really see it. I, I, I find the work to be very approachable. Um, you know, it, it may have seemed trans transgressive at the time, but, you know, but now, but now, you know, another whole generation has passed. And, and I think it's, I think it's uh, illustrative work. I think it's work that can, that can actually uh, teach another generation and future generations about finding oneself and about how they document their own community. Not to mention the man had a beautiful hand in the sense that he was really able to, to draw things in, in an amazing way. So congratulations to both of you so for, for the work. Um, I encourage everybody to uh, visit the site. Uh, let me say good night to my colleague, Paula Sierra. Paula, are you still there? Oh, yes, you are. Nice to see you. Thank you. Uh, she's in Miami, and I'm here in Fort Lauderdale. So everyone, it's been great to see you this evening. Uh, thanks to our guests. And um, come back. We'll be back in two weeks with our next show. And so um, everybody stay safe. Um, and if you haven't bought your, bought your ticket yet to our gala, they're almost run out. It's going to be on November 8th. So please be sure to buy a ticket there. So long, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.